Hello and welcome to a much less shit year or your money back. Uh, today, here, I'm giving you a little bit of the audiobook of Fuck Yeah Video Games. Uh, this is a chapter on Sega's hardware history, all the weird and wonderful peripherals, consoles and etc. that Sega came up with. Uh, it's just one of the chapters of the book. Um, this is this is what we like to call an advert uh, or a demo. It's kind of a demo. This is an audiobook demo and also something you haven't heard the audiobook. So I figured it'd be a good time just to release this, put it out there. Um, make you buy it. Please buy it. It's nice. I, I, I sound like I'm on Radio 4 in it. You know, it's a good thing. Um, but anyway, yeah, Happy New Year. And uh, here is like half an hour of me talking about Sega. Does that float your boat? Hardware history. Sega. I know, I know, after Sony and Nintendo you were expecting a section of Microsoft, but to be honest, Microsoft is a dull company. Even the slightly weird stuff like Kinect and HoloLens have a business feel about them. They're like a tie with cartoon dogs on it, worn by a very sensible man in a very sensible boardroom. The tie was bought for the very sensible man by his very proper daughter as a Christmas present. She calls him father. Sadly, she'll discover alcohol at university and ruin their relationship until a heart-wrenching reunion on his deathbed. He'll have the tie on. Even the nurses will cry. It'll win an Oscar. What? At Sega, on the other hand, aren't very sensible at all. Much like Spider-Man, Sega fling as much at the wall as possible and hope something sticks. PCs, consoles, handhelds without screens that only work on aircraft, you name it, Sega has cocked it up. Quick prologue, Sega came into being in 1965 during a merger of Service Games, a company that sold jukeboxes and slot machines to the American military, and Rosen Enterprises, an arcade machine manufacturer. They took the first two letters of Service and Games and made Sega, a way better company name than Cero, Scene, Gay, Scarrow, Gain, Rose, Roger, Rowan, Ents, Enger, or Enro. Actually, I quite like Enger. With a name in place, a fascinating, odd, and gently disastrous history began. Sega Vision. Television. Released 1976. Sega's first piece of hardware for the home was a seriously massive, for the time, 50-inch TV designed by Earl Madman Muntz, the used car salesman turned inventor who's credited with coming up with the word TV. If that's not a great first step in hardware, I don't know what is. And brilliantly, I found out about this machine while watching a very old episode of The Price is Right. The cost? $1,895 in 1976 money. The contestant trying to guess the price thought it was between $2,000 and $2,100. I therefore conclude that this TV was a bargain in 1976, and now that is a historical fact. SC3000. A computer. Released... 1983. The Sega Computer 3000, aside from being the most 1980s named product of all time, was Sega's first, and last, home computer. Inside it was a blistering 2 kilobytes of RAM, a phenomenal 16 kilobytes of VRAM, and an unfillable 32 kilobytes of ROM. I couldn't find any benchmarks for Crisis being played on it, but I assume it did spectacularly. Wedged under the right-hand side of the SC3000 was a slot for cartridges that needed to be filled or the machine wouldn't even run. The SC3000 played both its own and SG1000 cartridges, so it was backwards compatible out the gate. Wait, not backwards compatible, the SG1000 came out the same day. Sideways compatible. Hmm, much better. One of the hardware expansions for the SC3000 was the gloriously named Super Control Station SF7000. This VCR-shaped add-on gave the system a RAM and ROM boost, but most importantly, the ability to use 3-inch floppy disks. Yes, that's right, 3-inch. Not 3.5, not 5.25, not even 8-inch. 3-inch. But for the young people reading this, a floppy disk was like a USB drive, except for much bigger size-wise, uh, much smaller storage-wise, and worked with alarming infrequency. Also, God, do you remember 8-inch floppies? The first PC my family owned had an 8-inch drive, and I swear that whenever I put one of those in and it clunked down, the entire house shook. Anyway, 3-inch floppies. I literally didn't even know that was a thing. Floppy drives had a Betamax. Who knew? And for the young people reading this, Betamax was like Blu-ray, but with a much lower quality, durability, and popularity. Basically, HD DVDs. The SG-1000. A console, released 1983. 
Sega's first game console, the SG-1000, was released in Japan, Taiwan, and for some reason, New Zealand. It came out the same day as the SC-3000, and due to the decisions of someone who was presumably fired, the same day as Nintendo's Famicom. It was mostly filled with ports of arcade games, and you played them with a joystick that looked like it had fallen off of Kirk's chair from a Star Trek porn parody. The best game for it, Girls Garden by Sonic's future creator Yuji Naka, isn't very good at all. Actually, it might be great, but that joystick makes everything terrible. I tried it once, and the next day, my hand fell off. Normally, at this point, Paragraph 2 would turn things around and prove that it was actually worthwhile, but... Well, it's just not. The SG-1000 was a bit rubbish, and it only took Sega a year to replace it with a follow-up. Well, sort of, anyway. The SG-1000 2. Console, released 1984. The SG-1000 2 was given a whole new look over the SG-1000. New controllers replaced the terrible joystick, and... Absolutely nothing else changed. Internally, it was just an SG-1000 again. You could have performed this upgrade at home using nothing but a tin of paint and a marker to add the two. Unsurprisingly, this too was annihilated by the Famicom like a very small bird in a very big jet engine. Third time's the charm? The Sega Mark III. Console. Released 1985 Japan. Master System. Console. Released 1986 US, 1987 EU. The Sega Mark III and SG-1000 with upgraded RAM and GPU didn't sell that well in Japan. Neither did the Master System, a Mark III rebranded for the West when it launched in America a year later. By this point, Nintendo owned almost 80% of the entire games market, and Sega's floundering about with the SG-1000 line meant that they didn't have a hope of catching up. Yes, they were in second place, but first place was nothing more than a very small speck on the horizon of a very large planet. However, when it came to Europe, Nintendo made a mistake. In the UK, home computers were far, far more popular than home consoles. Nintendo ignored this, opting to sell the NES as a toy in the UK, just like they did in the US market. They hired Mattel to run their distribution, so here in Blighty, the NES ended up wedged between stomper trucks and strawberry shortcake dolls. Sega, on the other hand, hired Mastertronic, meaning that the Master System games ended up on the shelf with all the other home computers and games. This mistake led to the NES being considered a failure in the UK and the Master System finding a foothold. Sega's success spread across the similar European markets and finally Sega started to be a household name. Hooray! Best game for the system? Probably Sonic the Hedgehog. I mean, the Mega Drive version is superior, but it's got some damn fine level design that shouldn't be overlooked. Some even argue that the soundtrack is better. I mean, they're wrong, unfathomably so, but it's okay. It takes all sorts to make a world. Sega AI Computer. A computerish thing. Released 1986. And now for something completely different. The Sega AI computer is something of a mystery, with only sparse details recorded in English. Seemingly, it's an educational machine, possibly aimed at kids, where each game card comes with an overlay mat that you place onto the machine itself, giving each bit of software a unique control setup. It takes its name from the built-in AI that assists learning. I've no idea if it worked as an educational device or not, but considering that nobody with one was ever literate enough to write an article about it, I'm guessing not. The Sega Mega Drive console, released 1988 in Japan, 1990 in the EU, and as the Genesis in 1989 in the US. The Sega Mega Drive, Sega Genesis, or rather brilliantly, the Super Gam Star Boy in South Korea, is Sega's best-selling, best-looking, and generally best console. With over 700 games, including the Sonic the Hedgehog series, Streets of Rage 2, Disney's Aladdin, Columns, Toe Jam and Golden Axe, the Mega Drive was a force to be reckoned with, even against the upcoming SNES. Although not in Japan. Never in Japan. A fact largely forgotten by history is that the Mega Drive features the greatest console peripheral known to man, the Sega Mega Answer. This was an accessory that let you perform rudimentary online banking using a Sega Mega Drive. You could also get an optional printer to print out statements. How brilliant is that? I told you, Sega threw everything at the wall. One thing maybe they shouldn't have thrown at the wall was... Blood. When Mortal Kombat was released in 1993, Nintendo chose to censor the gore. 
Sega did not. This ended up giving the Sega version higher review scores, but also caused a huge controversy about violence in video games. Good thing we don't have those anymore. And a Senate hearing and ultimately led to the creation of the ESRB video game rating system, which we still use today. It was also my first games console, so as you would expect, I love everything about it. The Game Gear handheld. Released 1990 in Japan, 1991 EU and US. The Game Gear, Sega's first attempt at a handheld console, was basically a portable master system, albeit with slightly improved specs and colours. Sega planned to make the machine's inner workings as close to each other as possible so that master system games could be poured easily and the Game Gear's library could fill up quickly to compete with Nintendo's Game Boy. The downside of this was, and you know this one's coming, the battery life. The Game Boy used four AA batteries up in 30 hours. The Game Gear sucked six of them dry in around three. That full colour backlit LCD screen and powerful innards took up a lot of juice and that, combined with a lacklustre set of titles, killed the Game Gear dead. Now, that said, Rebecca has one and absolutely loves it, so I've been told that if I don't say that it's the best handheld ever, they'll divorce me. So in summary, it's the best handheld ever. The Sega Terra Drive, a PC, released 1991. Okay, so how great does this sound? A PC with a built-in Sega Mega Drive. Okay, so the PC is an early 90s IBM with an almost decade-old processor from 1982, but that's all just technicalities. Wonderfully, the PC and the console were connected, meaning that the Terra Drive could be used as a Mega Drive dev kit. If you ever wanted to design games for Sega's best console, or just wanted an IBM PC with two Mega Drive control ports in the front, this is the machine for you. The system proved unpopular and failed. Wikipedia. And possibly only you. Sega Mega CD, a console add-on, released 1991 in Japan, and released as the Sega CD, 1992 in the US and 1993 in the EU. Nestled under your Mega Drive, or later glued next to it, the Sega Mega CD added a nice dollop of increased specs to the Mega Drive, while also giving the titular CD support that gave developers more space to play with. Unfortunately, less than 10% of Mega Drive owners opted to buy one, so it fell a bit flat. Why develop a bigger game for the Mega CD and its much smaller audience when you could develop a little one for the Mega Drive? It had a few interesting games during its few years of life. Snatcher is a pile of Hideo Kojima's weirdness that's technically set in the canon future of Metal Gear Solid. Sonic CD is different, and Night Trap, a game about spying on women to stop them being attacked in the house, was so violent for the time that it featured prominently alongside Mortal Kombat in the 90s violent video games controversy. A recent re-release was rated T for Teen. Oh, the 90s were so cute. Sega Action Chair, an accessory, released 1992 in the UK. This is a chair controller. You read that correctly, a chair controller. Not a chair with a controller built in. This was a chair you used to control the game. Lean the entire chair left, and your character goes left. Lean the entire chair right, and your character probably goes left, because it inevitably wouldn't work. It's a chair. A fucking chair! Sega VR. Accessory. Unreleased. <gasps> Sega... <laughs> Sega's little foray into VR around this time never saw the light of day, but I just want to mention it because of the apparently great reason they had for axing it. Apparently it was just too damn realistic. They alleged that people would wander around and injure themselves, so they scrapped the whole thing. I suddenly feel better about every half assed excuse I ever gave for missing homework. The Activator. Accessory. Released. 1993 in the US. With a VR system failing in the background, Sega decided that now was the time to enter the world of motion controls. Instead of fannying about with a silly glove, they opted for a ring that you placed on the floor around you that shot invisible beams of magic into the ceiling. Now all you had to do was break the beams and you'd do the corresponding move. You'd kick, punch and flail in various directions and your on-screen character would do something maybe a bit similar to that. The 
fighting genre was about to be turned on its head. Well, no, fighting games are based on reaction times and pressing a few buttons is infinitely faster than having to break dance in 17 different directions at once just to do a Hadouken. Additionally, it was terrible at detecting players' movements and frankly didn't work at all if you had something other than a perfectly flat ceiling. It didn't sell well. Shocker. Sega Pico. Console. Released 1993 in Japan, 1994 the EU and the US. How far are we from the first great educational video games console for the home? Huffington Post, 2013. Minus at least 25 years by my count. The Sega Pico was a bright and chunky edutainment console aimed at kids and arguably one of Sega's most revolutionary consoles. And revolutionary in a good way, not revolutionary in a let's make a chair into a fucking controller way. It was one of the first educational consoles to ship worldwide and one of the first consoles ever to use a touchscreen as its primary input device. The cartridges were huge because they actually housed a book inside of it that was used with the game. It's actually a really neat bit of kit. Unlike almost everything else in this section, the Pico did remarkably well in Japan. It lasted for 10 years and ended up with a library of no more than 300 games with titles such as... And then I, I list a few of the really confusing Japanese titles, um, which I'm not going to read on the audiobook because I will inevitably get it wrong. Chance I could swear. Uh, it's your fault for backing a, a low quality tier, really. You put this upon yourself. <laughs> oh, and a bug's life! Guess which of these three made it to the American market? <laughs> AWA CSD G1M, a CD player, released 1994. When Sega saw the breadth of their domain, they wept, for there were no more random electronics to jam a Mega Drive into. Then an intern pointed at a CD player and they just went with it. It was Friday. You can't blame them. Sega Pods! A toy, released 1994. Odd little duck this, Sega Pods were a set of large teardrop shaped devices that could light up, play sounds and detect if your hands were above them. They were mostly used to play variations of Simon Says, but the packaging claimed that this was the futuristic game of lights and sounds. Futuristic game of lights and sounds? Isn't that just video games? Sega Channel. Accessory, released 1994, Japan and the US, 1996 in the EU. Okay, this one is mad, but fucking brilliant. Sega Channel was a subscription service for downloading games. Yeah, you read that right. After subscribing, or oh, you listen. After subscribing, you were sent a chunky cartridge that you plugged into your Mega Drive and were given access to a TV channel that broadcast static signals on a loop. Your new hardware could use this static and, through some sort of fucking magic, could translate it into games. These games were stored in the RAM of the Mega Drive and, hey presto, you just downloaded a full Mega Drive game from your TV in 1994. Bwah? Okay, yes, yeah, so the game's being saved to the RAM and they delete themselves when the console's turned off. Shh. So, am I saying that Sega may have been the pioneer of downloading games? Possibly. But there's more to it than that. Due to the way the Sega channel was broadcast, any sort of noise or interference would break up the download and cause errors. Sega combated this by working with cable companies directly to clean and improve their cable signal quality, leading to huge improvements in cable infrastructure. Basically, the Sega channel helped usher in the era of cable internet that we know and complain about today. That's pretty good for a TV channel with more static than a house exclusively fitted with nylon carpets. The 32X console add-on. Released 1994, Japan and the US, 1995 EU. Proving that it learnt nothing from the Mega CD, Sega once again offered up another performance upgrade peripheral for the Mega Drive that was harder to develop for and had a much smaller audience. It was meant to bridge the gap between the Mega Drive and the Sega Saturn, but balls that up, in Japan at least, by coming out after it. The 32X only had 40 games and six of those needed the Sega CD add-on too. Now I don't know what a Mega Drive looks like when you plug both of those things at once, but I'm assuming something like Ron Weasley's house. The Sega Saturn. Console, released 1994, Japan and 1995, the EU and the US. After six years and 2.2 billion, 
unique peripherals, Sega finally replaced the Mega Drive with the 32-bit CD-ROM equipped Saturn, capable of 1.21 gigaflops of polygon bamboozery, I think that's right, and coming off of their hottest console, the Saturn was the surest bet this side of a grey sports almanac and a DeLorean. Of course, it failed. Why? Well, for a start, they buggered up the release something fierce. It was slated for September 1995, but at the very first E3 of all places, Sega announced that it had already shipped 30,000 units of the new $399 console to certain retailers, available to buy right now. Good hype move, right? Well, no. All the companies they didn't give stock to started to refuse any and all Sega goods. It meant no Sega presence in tiny places such as Walmart and Best Buy. Oh no. To rub salt laced with itching powder into the wound, at the same E3, Sony Computer Entertainment America's president Steve Race announced the PlayStation's price by walking onto the stage saying 299 and walking off again. Sadly, unlike Andrew House's version of this in 2013 with the PlayStation 4, nobody chanted Sony's name while whooping. The 90s were a more dignified time. To hammer one last nail into the coffin, the Saturn never got a proper Sonic game. The one being created for it, Sonic Extreme, was cancelled and focus shifted to the Dreamcast. All the Saturn had was a port of Sonic CD, Sonic Jam, which is a collection of Mega Drive games with a neat 3D overworld, and Sonic R, a fun racing game with one of the best soundtracks in a game ever. Pity it took longer to go to the store and buy it than it did to actually complete it. Outside of Sonic, the Saturn has a pretty good library. Virtual Fighter 2 showed the world how smooth 60 FPS can be, Panzer Dragoon Saga is still the best on-rails game of all time, and Nights into Dreams is also here. The Saturn did well in Japan though, mostly due to its strength in running 2D games and great arcade ports. Actually thinking about it, I've realised that Sega's entire history can basically be converted into one repeatable Madlib. In year, Sega released the console. It sold quite well in one country, but terribly elsewhere, resulting in it being regarded as a failure. Eh, it works. Sega Mega Jet. A semi-portable? Released 1994 in Japan. This Japanese-only console was a portable Mega Drive semi-portable as it didn't have its own screen. The idea was that you rented it on Japan airline flights, plugged it into your seat and could play Mega Drive games on the little screen in front of you. Imagine that! Being able to replace the horrific screams of a confused baby with the energetic beats of Green Hill Zone. It worked with your own cartridges too. I mean, back then you could take cartridges through airport security, mostly because there wasn't any airport security. Recently, I tried to take a PS3 through security, but was informed that I couldn't take it on board unless I could open it first. I missed that flight in the end. Eventually, Sega even went as far as to sell the Mega Jet in stores. It needed a screen and power to run, so it was basically just a console with a D-pad, but it was the closest the world had come to a portable Mega Drive. <sighs> now, wouldn't that be something? Genesis Nomad. Portable. Released. 1995 in the US. I must admit that before I started researching all this Sega malarkey, I had no idea that this even existed. Now I want one. Your purchase of this book has helped me achieve this goal, thank you. The Genesis Nomad is a portable Mega Drive. Well, portable Genesis. Heartbreakingly, it never released in Europe. With almost the entire Genesis library available to use at launch, with the obvious exceptions of the 32X and Mega CD games, the Nomad was sure to be a hit. Sega flung it up for sale and, proving they've still learnt nothing about their failures, had another flop on their hands. God damn it, Sega! It was massive and bulky and far too expensive and somehow, somehow ate batteries faster than the Game Gear. Apparently six entire AA batteries lasted just two hours. To travel my regular journey from Edinburgh to London's King's Cross and back again, I need to bring 30 bloody batteries. Plus, as these were just Genesis games and most didn't have a save function, you'd lose all progress with each battery change too. Yep, I still want one. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug. Dreamcast. Console. Released 1998 in Japan, 
1999, the EU in the US. Well, this is it. Sega's exit from the console market. The Dreamcast launched just four years after the Saturn and was immediately drowned out by the PS2, a console that wasn't even out yet. The PS2 had it all. DVD playback, massive publisher support, and a second analogue stick. What did the Dreamcast have? Online gaming, too early to work well, a lack of third-party support due to development difficulty and exclusivity arguments, and a controller that looked like Voltron's codpiece. Quick side note here, EA wanted to be the only company to make sports games for the Dreamcasts. Sega rightly told them to shove it and purchased company Visual Concepts, who would eventually turn it to 2K games when they sold them to take two a few years later. Everything is connected. Yet, it wasn't a total loss. The Dreamcast died faster than my will to live in a shoe shop, but in that short time it spawned some incredible games. Ikaruga is widely considered to be one of the best shoot 'em ups ever made. Jet Set Radio invented the cell shaded art style that hundreds of games have emulated. Crazy Taxi still sells its endless ports to this day. Soul Calibur defined the fighting genre for years. Shenmue made waiting for the bus in real time almost fun. And Sonic Adventure is still the best 3D Sonic game and when I'm king I'll make it illegal to disagree. Just three years after launch in Japan and less than 18 months in the UK, the Dreamcast was discontinued. Sega had hemorrhaged money, so stepped away and let the modern giants of Sony, Nintendo and Microsoft battle it out. On the 31st of March 2001, Sega left the console business forever. Or did they? Advanced Pico Bina! Console! Released 2005! Just four years after they faked their own death, Sega launched a streamlined and superior version of their Pico console to the Japanese market. There's not much interesting to write about, however, it was never officially discontinued. Meaning that Sega are still secretly in the console industry. I don't know why, but that makes me so happy. Sega Vision Media Player, released 2009. No, Sega aren't Benjamin Button in their way back along their own timeline. Not entirely, anyway. The Sega Vision, not to be confused with the big TV, the Sega Vision, is a little media player that plays music, video, ebooks, etc. As far as I can tell, it's never been purchasable in stores or can only be won via arcade games in selected locations. There is one currently on eBay for £10 and I might buy it. When it was first announced, the Sega Vision was shown playing a few little Flash games, so people ran with this and after a while headlines were blaring that Sega were about to re-enter the game market to fight the DS and the PSP. In response, Sega quietly removed the gaming abilities from the machine. I'm not crying, you're crying. Sega Dreamcast 2 Super Console Released 2033 They said it would never happen. They said Sega would never come back, but they did, and they did it with a plum. I don't know what to talk about first. The controllers that were individually sculpted for each player's hands, the total lack of terrible peripherals, or the incredible lineup of games, all of which featured Sonic, and none with a Metacritic score lower than 95. All of this for just £8.99, pence, making it a bargain to boot. Sega was finally ready to rule from on high. Sadly, however, it was discontinued after three months due to low sales in Japan. So that's the long, weird and hopefully interesting history of Sega. Giving an interview with The Guardian in 2008, Peter Moore, ex-head of Sega America, said this. Sega had the option of pouring in more money and going bankrupt and they decided they wanted to live to fight another day. So we licked our wounds, ate some humble pie, and went to Sony and Nintendo to ask for dev kits. And you know what? That humble pie was the best thing Sega ever ate. They were terrible at hardware, most of their successes were down to luck, all of their failures were their own fault, and they faltered and failed in every way except one. The games. Each console, each poor dead on arrival console had a defining library of great games and with every piece of hardware Sega got better at making them. Since leaving the console market behind they've given us new series such as the swear word inducing Super Monkey Ball, the angry man punching experience of Yakuza, wartime strategy with Company of Heroes, the off kilter hack and slashing Bayonetta and the granddaddy of battle simulation Total War. Oh and also Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. Well, we all make mistakes. <laughs>